Sorry about that. Uh, is this the microphone set right? Yeah. Terrific. Okay. Uh, I thought I was. There we go. Sorry about the red. I don't know what the red is about. Uh, It's often held that conscious states, unlike mental states that are not conscious, have some special tie to rationality, intentional action, or executive function. Perhaps a mental state's being conscious enhances rationality, or even enable uh, rationality, intentional action, or executive control, or even makes those things possible. If so, those functions might help explain why creatures evolved with mental states that are sometimes, even, especially in our case, often conscious states. When I speak of function here, I'm simply going to be speaking of utility for the animal itself, human animal or other kind of animal. I'm going to raise doubts about these ties that are very often claimed for consciousness, ties with rationality, intentional action, and executive control. Indeed, I'm going to argue that consciousness has very little, if any, utility, and that we must explain its occurrence not by appeal to its being beneficial, and therefore by being grabbed onto by natural selection, but in some other way. I'm going to rely on <coughs> three kinds of factors. I'm going to rely on folk psychological observations, theoretical considerations, and a few experimental findings. And I'm going to argue that the utility even of states that are conscious is due to factors other than those states being conscious. A first caveat, having little or no utility does not mean having no causal efficacy. So the view I'll develop does not imply or even suggest what people in philosophy call epiphenomenalism. There's a bit of equivocation here. Uh, people in philosophy think that epiphenomenalism means it has no causal efficacy at all. Sensible people in medicine and biology think it just has no use. Epiphenomenalism means it has no useful function. I am going to be arguing that. A second preliminary, I'm concerned only with the utility of mental states being conscious. What is added by a state's being conscious as opposed to that state's occurring without being conscious. So my concern is not with the utility of an individual's being conscious, as against that individual's being asleep or comatose, for example, nor with the utility of an individual's being conscious or aware of something, uh, which I've elsewhere called transitive consciousness, and that term will figure again in section four. These are plainly three distinct properties, and you can tell that there are three distinct properties by considering the contraries of those properties, unconscious or not conscious or non-conscious. They have different application conditions in the three cases, the three cases being the case of a mental state's being conscious, an individual's being conscious, and an individual's being conscious of something. Plainly, an individual's being conscious, that is, the individual's being awake and responsive to stimuli, is crucial for its functioning and survival. And being in mental states in virtue of which one is conscious of various things is also, of course, vital to successful functioning. But these benefits need not be due to the mental states being conscious. Even when an individual is conscious, not all of that individual's mental states are themselves conscious states. And one can be aware of things by being in states that aren't themselves conscious states, as happens in subliminal perceiving. It must be when you subliminally perceive something that you're aware of the stimulus, because otherwise it wouldn't have any effect on downstream psychological processing. One is aware of the stimulus, but not, as we might say, consciously aware of the stimulus. And my focus here is going to be solely on whether there is some benefit for mental states, thoughts, feelings, etc., to be conscious. A third preliminary, I'll be concerned mainly today with conscious intentional states such as thoughts and volitions. <laughs> 
But most of what I'm going to say today applies with little or very often no adjustment at all to whether being conscious adds utility when the states are qualitative, such as sensing, perceiving, and emotions. That is, utility in, a, in addition to what those states would have, the sensing, perceiving, or being in emotions, the utility in addition to what they would have when those states occur without being conscious. Qualitative states do occur without being conscious. I've argued elsewhere. We can talk about that more if you'd like in discussion. As in various forms of subliminal perceiving, and those states being conscious very likely adds very little, if any, utility. But I'll have time this morning only to indicate in passing how the considerations that I'm going to present, which apply in the first instance to thoughts and volitions, apply also to these qualitative states. A fourth very brief preliminary about how my argument relates to my theory of consciousness, which is, appeals to what I've called higher order thoughts. That theory, as Dretzky and others have noted, leaves it open. It does not imply, but it leaves it open that a state's being conscious has little utility. I'm going to mention this higher order thought theory briefly in section four. But what's important for our purposes today is simply this, namely that the argument that I'm presenting that consciousness has little if any utility in no way relies on that higher order thought theory. It's completely independent of that theory. So you can think the theory is no good at all and still think that my argument today is good. I'd prefer you think both are good, but take what I can get. Rather, if my argument is right, it's going to provide some independent, if somewhat indirect, substantiation that the higher order thought hypothesis is at least on the right track. Final preliminaries, very briefly, it may seem that consciousness has some utility because of its subjective centrality in our own lives, but of course, that's not a basis for thinking in a serious way that there is utility there. It's central in a subjective way. That doesn't mean utility. Positive function is also inviting since we can understand things only insofar as we can locate those things within an explanatory net and therefore within a causal net of some sort or other. So consciousness, perhaps we might think, can explain. We, we can understand it only if we can explain what utility it causes, what utility it leads to. But we can explain consciousness by appeal not to utility, but rather by appeal to the causal factors that give rise to some mental states being conscious. So it, it can be on the incoming end that we, appeal, that we locate consciousness within an explanatory net, not the outgoing end. Appeal to utility is also common in biology and hence neuroscience, but uh, at the risk of uh, causing controversy, I'll say, it's, I think, very often a lot less helpful at a distinctively psychological level of study. Okay, on to some substance. The philosopher Sidney Shoemaker has expressed a standard idea about the function of consciousness, namely that adjusting first order beliefs and desires to make those states more rational requires that one have second order beliefs about what one's current beliefs and desires are. And that's because, Shoemaker continues, first order beliefs and desires do not rationalize changes in themselves. And similarly, the philosopher David Armstrong has presented what he calls a teleological deduction that some mental states must be conscious. And that teleological deduction holds that any animal that solves problems mentally must be aware of its relevant mental states. Some theorists actually build a tie of consciousness with rationality into the very account of what it is for a state to be conscious as with Ned Block's well-known notion of access consciousness. A state is access conscious 
on Bloch's notion if its content is poised for use as a premise in reasoning and for the rational control of action and speech. I've underscored the bits that have to do with rationality. Access consciousness is therefore, in effect, the type of consciousness that, that figures in rationality. A state is access conscious if, but only if, it has the potential to figure in rational thought and action. Uh, I forgot with all of this technical stuff, a very important technical prop that I need. The idea that consciousness has some essential tie to rationality also inspires the well-known global workspace theories of consciousness, which we heard Bernie Barr's talk about uh, uh, a couple of days ago, and that Stan DeHaan has developed in very elegant detail, on which a state is conscious just in case it has global ties to a variety of cognitive systems, ties that subserve the rationality of one's thoughts and desires. All that aside, introspection itself, when we look inside of ourselves, may seem to point to a tie between consciousness and rationality, since, after all, we're introspectively aware of our own rationality only when the relevant thinking is itself conscious thinking. Similarly, and this will come up in section three, the next section, introspection may also seem to sustain a tie between consciousness and attentional action, since when actions are conscious, we're aware in a first-person way of our actions as being intentional. So a bunch of considerations. Starting at the end, introspection can't really be relied on in any way at all here. And that's because introspection has access only to conscious states. It can't reveal, therefore, a tie that those states have with rationality or with intentional action that non-conscious mental states lack. First-person access can't compare conscious with non-conscious mental states. So introspection can't help us determine what utility mental states being conscious might add over and above those states occurring without being conscious. And various folk observations suggest that consciousness adds little functionality. Thinking is often rational without its being conscious. And behavior is often rational, that is, rationally keyed to various goals, even when none of the thoughts and desires that lie behind that thinking are conscious. We sometimes solve problems and work out plans rationally but not consciously, as when things just come to us, evidently as the result of rational thinking that isn't conscious can't get my mind around this particular problem, go for a walk, go to sleep, whatever, all of a sudden it comes to me. Uh, no conscious thinking about it's coming to me. It comes to me, that's the way it works. And we often even have a first person sense that such behavior is rational. That is to say, when it just comes to us, it doesn't seem, well, it just came to us out of the blue, and that's magic. It seems it came to us rationally. Even when we correct or adjust our reasoning, conscious monitoring of that reasoning seldom figures. Typically, it simply seems that we come to see things more clearly. Thus, it's relatively unusual that we adjust reasoning by consciously rehearsing the steps in that reasoning. And when we do consciously rehearse the steps in that reasoning, like you know, writing them down, one, two, three, four, five, that process is typically somewhat slow and awkward. There, that's why we have to write it down, or that's why very often in that kind of case we write it down. There's confirmation of this. Well, this is ever so slightly. Uh, Axel Claremont isn't here yet, right? Okay, good. Uh, um, Up Dijkster uh, House and colleagues have done uh, work uh, that seems to show that deliberating about complex consumer choices, what refrigerator, car, etc., to buy, both in and outside the lab, actually yields better results when the deliberating is not conscious. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce uh, 
this guy's name, Warwick Quick, anyhow, uh, uh, he did work with Axel uh, that cast doubt on Dijkstra House's methodology, but the results that Dijkstra House presented uh, have been uh, replicated by Usher et al. in ways that seem to get around all of uh, the methodological objections that um, Axel and his colleagues uh, uh, put forth. Such experimental results aside, people seem especially intuitive in their thinking in a way that often works better than conscious ratiocination, step by step. Such intuitive thinking often seems more perceptive, penetrating, and compelling. But the thinking that we call intuitive is presumably just thinking that isn't conscious, indeed isn't encumbered by the process of its being conscious. Since conscious thinking can interfere with such intuitive thinking and even present it altogether, prevent it altogether, sorry, this is a common sense case in which conscious thinking not only isn't beneficial, but can actually be deleterious. So that's a common sense case that actually corresponds to the Dijkstra House results. David Armstrong argues that if our mind is to work purposefully, we must have awareness of our minds. He continues, only by being in a state, only by being aware of our current mental state can we adjust mental behavior to mental circumstance. Only if we do, do become so aware will we know what to do, that is to say, what to think, next. This reflects Armstrong's perceptual model of consciousness. Armstrong thinks that a mental state is conscious if we, in effect, have a higher order perception of that state. And this picture of Armstrong's involves our perceptually surveying our mental states somewhat as we survey physical objects and then move them around and adjust them to be the way we would like. But we seldom, if ever, I think we never survey our cognitive states in that way and certainly never do so perceptually. Our mental processing typically relies solely on causal interactions among the states that are connected themselves, not by surveying them, but just the states being connected. And all of this points to an important theoretical reason to expect that thinking and planning would often be rational, indeed that it typically would be rational, wholly independent of being conscious. The rationality of thoughts and desires is solely a matter of connections among the intentional contents of the relevant states. Nothing else figures in whether thinking and planning are rational. An intentional state such as thoughts and desires must interact causally in ways that reflect their intentional content. Sorry. Indeed, on many, though not all, theories of intentional content, a state's content simply is a matter of that state's causal connections, or at least is partly a matter of that state's causal connections, not the actual causal connections simply, but actual together with potential causal connections. Uh, and all we need here is the partial dependence that I think all theorists these days agree about. So a state will have the content, for example, that it's raining, only if that state has suitable causal connections, actual and potential, with other thoughts and desires that are relevant to its reigning. Even, forget that. Uh, well, even atomic theories which say, uh, which reject uh, to the greatest extent possible the interdependence of intentional content, one state with another, agree that in some way or another uh, intentional content has to track these things. Given all of this, uh, the tie between content and causal potential uh, will lead to thoughts and desires tending to cause and tending to be caused by other thoughts and desires that they have rational ties with. And that's because rational ties pertain to content <coughs> 
and to useful empirical knowledge. And that's all independent of whether the thoughts and desires are conscious. This whole bit about what rationality consists in, in the mind, has nothing to do with whether the thoughts and desires are conscious. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Indeed, even when thinking is conscious, and this is a slightly subtle but very important point, it's being conscious is going to contribute little, if anything, to the rationality, since rationality depends on content, it does not depend on consciousness. So lots of rational thought will be conscious, but what makes it rational is going to be the connections among the states that are independent of those states being conscious. Sorry. These considerations pertain not only to thoughts and desires, but to perceptions as well. Perceptual role provides ties among perceptual states that subserve rationality and related types of utility. Even perceptual and bodily sensations, though they lack intentional content, still represent perceptible properties and states of one's body. So their causal potential must in some way subserve rational ties that those states have with thinking. Non-conscious perception and blind state, proposagnosia, amnesia, other such states, does seem, as Larry Weisskrantz has pointed out, to impair flexible thinking about relevant matters. But the trouble with the suggestion that that means that consciousness has some utility here is that these conditions all involve other kinds of defects, right? And it may be the other deficits that get in the way of uh, flexible thinking uh, about the relevant matters and not a matter of the absence of those states be, uh, of consciousness for those states. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, there's been some talk about the connection between uh, language and consciousness, so a couple of slides I was going to skip, I'm not going to skip after all. One can non-inferentially report a state only if that state is conscious. I can tell you about my thought that it's raining only if I'm aware of the thought that it's raining. And if I'm aware of the thought that it's raining, then that thought is a conscious thought. So might it be that the ability to report is a function of consciousness that we can get only when the state is conscious? No. Reporting one's thought or intention does little or nothing that can't be done simply by expressing those states verbally. So instead of telling you that I think that it's conscious, sorry, instead of telling you that I think that it's raining, I can just say it's raining. And that does just as well to enhance whatever social stuff is enhanced by communicating my thoughts. I communicate them not by telling you about the thought, but by giving verbal expression to the thought. Uh, that just says the same thing. Uh, verbally expressed thoughts, this is a very peculiar fact. Verbally expressed thoughts are always conscious. Uh, so if I say that it's raining, uh, my thought that it's raining, that's being expressed by my speech act that it's raining, is always a conscious thought. If on the other hand, I just walk out of my home and grab my umbrella in an absent kind of way, my thought that it's raining may not be conscious. It may be expressed in nonverbal behavior without being conscious. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the explanation of this. Uh, this kind of observation has led people from Descartes on to say mysterious magical connection between consciousness and language. Uh, Mysterious, magical, that's very, very bad. I actually have an explanation for what the connection is, and the connection uh, is such that there is no utility that's added by uh, the states being conscious, but that's all I'm going to say right now. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide, and here we are at section three. The foregoing considerations apply also to the tie that's often claimed to hold between consciousness and intentional actions, that is, actions that result from one's own prior volitions. 
The potential of a volition to result in action tracks the content of that volition. So utility is a matter of whatever causal potential goes with the intentional content of the volition, and that's independent of whether the volition is a conscious state. Volitions, like other mental states, need not be conscious. An action is intentional if it's initiated by a volition and is in that way under one's control, even if the volition is not a conscious state. Acting intentionally does require that one perceive one's environment, but the volitions need not be conscious, and even the perceiving itself need not be conscious, though that's somewhat more rare, uh, at least in experimental cases, but it has been done even with blindsight patients and so forth. All that aside, even when an intention is conscious, its being conscious very likely plays no role whatsoever in the producing of the action. And this has to do with work that's been referred to several times by Benjamin Libet, which was refined and replicated, refined in very elegant ways by Patrick Haggard. Those results show that when subjects consciously decide to perform a simple action, the neural event, which people call a readiness potential, that initiates the action occurs prior to any conscious volition. So there's a question, how should this be interpreted? I think the best interpretation, whoops, is very clearly that we have to distinguish the volition itself from the volitions being conscious. Subjects are conscious of their volitions only after the relevant readiness potential. So we can identify the readiness potential, which occurs before any awareness of a volition. We can identify the readiness potential with the volition, but with a volition that occurs non-consciously. And we can see the Libet haggard results as indicating a lag between the initial onset of the volition itself and the volitions coming to be conscious. It's likely that this holds for all intentional states, that is to say the states that occur, for example, just in plain old thinking as opposed to volitional thinking. The trouble is that the brain isn't cooperating because the brain buries uh, those states a little deeper so it's harder to get uh, both spatial and temporal resolution with current uh, 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 methods. Uh, and if so, thoughts and rational action and executive function, uh, I'll turn to executive function in the next section, also occur prior to and therefore independently of those states being conscious. These results show that volitions cause behavior without being conscious. One's behavior and one's subjective awareness of the volition are jointly caused by the volition before it comes to be conscious. So even though there may be types of behavior that occur in humans or even in general, only when the relevant volitions and desires are conscious, by itself that does not show that the volitions being conscious plays any role whatsoever in enabling those behaviors. Rather, non-conscious volitions arguably cause two things independently. They cause, in the first place, the relevant behavior, and they cause, in the second place, awareness of the volition, so that the volition comes to be conscious. Uh, Libet argued that the conscious ability to call off an action provided a role for conscious volition. I think Libet was worried, in particular, what's happening to free will, which we discussed yesterday. Uh, it seems as though... Uh, the Libert Haggard results seem to me to show what's happened to free will, there isn't any. Uh, I mean, it seems that there is, and it's seeming that there is, that's important by itself, but there isn't actual any. But the conscious calling off, which Libet called a veto, is likely itself to occur in the first instance without being conscious and then become conscious. Uh, the time scale in that case, this is so there's a readiness potential and uh, before the action actually occurs, uh, you become aware of 
the volition, and then you call it off. And so the time scale is very, very tight there, so it's hard to test for this. But you would expect that it's the, the veto is going to be just another volition, so it's going to, the same things will apply in that case. Uh, Haggard has claimed that the ability to call off the action provides a predictive check on whether one really wants to go through with the action. But that's not a function of consciousness unless that predictive check itself cannot occur and does not occur without being conscious. And Haggard has, to my knowledge, pre presented no reason to think that that's the case. Um, uh, if one is clear uh, to the effect that, um, so there's this volition, and the volition causes two things independently. It causes the action, and it also causes the awareness of the volition, right? And that those, that it doesn't have to be that the action is only caused once the awareness of the volition comes about. Those are independently caused. Once one is clear about that, then it doesn't seem anymore as though uh, Wegner's story about um, uh, conscious volition being the mind's trick for um, uh, knowing who's doing the action uh, provides a good explanation, but I'll leave that for discussion. Uh, maybe I'm also going to skip Larry Jacoby's wonderful exclusion test, and we can talk about that if anybody wants to later. Uh, and I'll skip height and green, and I'll skip phenomenology. Um, sorry. Uh, as long as I'm skipping phenomenology. Okay, so uh, here is some water. One might think, uh, there's a hard problem about water. The hard problem about water is how could water be made of quarks or at least, you know, subatomic particles or whatever. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, you know, how can we explain that? Well, nobody thinks that's a hard problem just as nobody today thinks that vitalism presents a kind of a hard problem about the existence of life because we have big theories that these phenomena are embedded within. Uh, my view of the hard problem so-called is that Chalmers had it exactly right, except with the labels reversed. The hard problem is the stuff that a lot of you people are doing, namely figuring out how the machinery actually works so that we will, in the end, have a good theory about how the mind works based on this machinery. When we have that theory, it won't seem that there's any leftover problem because just like water and subatomic particles, we'll just say the theory tells us how these things work. It won't seem that anything is left over. Right now, we have virtually no serious theory of those things. And so the thing that Chalmers calls a hard problem, which I think is the easy problem, once we've solved the hard problem, which is the theory, uh, the <clears throat> problem about the relationship between the brain and feeling that looks difficult at this point. Uh, I think it won't be. That's phenomenology. Okay. Uh, section four, the last section, executive control and high order states. The Libid Haggard findings which show that a state's being conscious occurs later than, and because of that independently of, the state itself provides evidence for an increasingly prevalent type of theory about what it is for a mental state to be a conscious state. On these so-called higher order theories, a state's being conscious consists in one's being aware of the state in some suitable way. This family of theories and the core idea behind them is compelling since a state of which one is in no way at all aware does not intuitively count as a conscious state. I'm going to call that principle the thing on top which is underlined, I'm going to call that the transitivity principle since it holds that one is aware, transitively aware, of all of one's conscious states. Higher order theories all endorse the transitivity principle, but they differ about how that transitivity principle is implemented. I've argued elsewhere that the transitivity principle is best thought of as implemented by distinct higher order thoughts about one's own mental states, thoughts to the effect that one is in the state in question. This fits well with the foregoing empirical findings and conclusions. 
states occur independently of the higher order thoughts in virtue of which those states may be conscious. And it also suggests a natural way to explain volitions becoming conscious after those volitions initially occur. Their being conscious is due to a distinct higher order thought, and that distinct higher order thought is usually caused by the volition that comes first, and so the higher order thought about the volition, which makes it conscious, is going to occur slightly later. Um, the exclusion task thing, which I skipped, Larry Jacoby, uh, I think that that also fits in well with this theory. The transitivity principle also predicts the important tie that's crucial in really all experimental work, but also crucial, I think, in everyday life. Uh, the crucial tie between the state's being conscious and it's being reportable. Since one can report something if, but only if, one is aware of that thing. And that applies to one's own mental states. Moreover, the reportability test for a state's being conscious points to distinct higher order thoughts as the way the transitivity principle is best thought of as being implemented. Reporting one's mental state expresses a thought to the effect that one is in that state. So just being able to report a state signals the occurrence of the higher order thought that one would express if one did report that state. Executive function is the adjusting and fine tuning of one's behavior and hence the adjusting of one's first order volitions. Because of that, executive function is often associated with higher order processing which on higher order theories suggests that at least it's possible that executive function is connected with consciousness. But such adjusting is often a matter in just the ways that I've been arguing in the previous section of ironing out conflicts among competing or dissonant first order desires and beliefs. My first order desires and beliefs, independent of being conscious, conflict in some way and somehow or another they jostle around and get things settled. And this ironing out can result simply from causal interactions among the first order states. All thoughts and desires have causal ties with other thoughts and desires, ties that track their intentional content, and the ones that have stronger ties typically win out. Whoops, sorry. Moreover, even if executive processing does involve higher order states, those states may not be the kind needed for the first order states to be conscious. A state's being conscious requires that one be aware of oneself as being in that state. And the higher order states that may occur in executive processing, sometimes, not always, may not have the right content for that. The processing may simply register conflict among various particular contents and point to possible adjustments without representing oneself as being in any particular state. It's often noticed that learning to play tennis or a musical instrument initially involves the careful, attentive, deliberate rehearsing of specific actions that later come to be executed in a routine way and without deliberate attention. And sometimes it's said that the actions when you first learn to play tennis are conscious and then the actions stop being conscious. I'm not talking, I'm not quite sure what people mean by that even. I'm talking about conscious intentions, conscious mental goings on, not consciousness of one's actions. Uh, that's an interesting topic also, but not the one I'm addressing. Uh, some have concluded from this that the, since the earlier actions which are not automatic have to be deliberately and attentively executed, they must stem from conscious intentions. And it's also sometimes held that deliberate attentive actions require executive control, whereas routine actions do not. But deliberate intending need not itself be conscious. Deliberate intending is simply intending that occurs as a result of deliberation. And the deliberation itself, just as with the intending, need not be conscious. Nor is attention itself 
always conscious. Uh, there's been just a truckload of double dissociation between mental states being conscious and their being attentive. Uh, and even if the attentive deliberation that is characteristic of the non-routine actions in learning complex activities like playing tennis are typically conscious, we've already seen that a state's being conscious may not be what adds anything. It may be, well, what's important here is that it's very attentive and very deliberate, right? And that is independent of consciousness. That's the, the, those are two factors that sometimes occur with volitions. Consciousness is another factor. And there's no reason to think that they have to go together. In fact, a lot of evidence that they don't. Uh, I'll skip hypnosis. You've got uh, about another three minutes. Three minutes. Well, maybe. Uh, um, let's see. I'll skip that. Um, I'll skip that. I'll skip Aristotle, certainly. Uh, a final methodological point. I'm going to come in under three minutes. A final methodological point. Uh, high order thoughts figured in this argument uh, that had to do with executive function only in order to undermine the idea that if it's true that executive function relies on some higher order processing and a state's being conscious also consists in having a higher order thought about that state, being conscious is therefore useful in making executive control possible. That's the only reason that I referred at all to the higher order thought theory. So my argument against utility is still independent, as I said at the outset, of that theory. My arguments against functionality do sometimes appeal to considerations that I've also independently used to support higher order, theory, higher order thought theory, but those considerations support both the higher order thought theory and the absence of significant utility independent of one another. So in summary, even when mental states are conscious, their being conscious does little, if anything, to facilitate rational thinking, intentional action, or executive function. And elsewhere, I've argued that we can, but this is a very long story, independent of any such utility, and therefore independent of any evolutionary selection pressures, explain why so many mental states, at least in humans, and very likely in all mammals, I would think, and very likely in birds, and I don't know about fish, uh, explain why so many mental states do occur consciously, but that's a story for another occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Questions quickly. We'll have five.